This is your brain on risk. This is Mind Over Money, the podcast where Kevin Cook exposes the psychology of investing. Welcome back to Mind Over Money. I'm Kevin Cook, your field guide and storyteller for the fascinating arena of behavioral economics. This is a very important episode because it's about the collision of technology, culture, and education. And it goes back to my first love in college, philosophy. You probably heard the news over the weekend that Apple received a letter on Saturday from two large shareholders, Jana Partners, a, a leading activist investor, and the California State Teachers Retirement System, a major pension fund. That letter, first reported by the Wall Street Journal on Sunday, urged Apple to develop new software tools to help parents control and limit phone use. They also asked the company to assist in studying the impact of overuse of smartphones on mental health. I'll just read, uh, I think this is one of the quotes right from the letter. Uh, Yes, this is. There is a developing consensus around the world, including Silicon Valley, that the potential long-term consequences of new technologies need to be factored in at the outset, and no company can outsource that responsibility said the investors, who collectively control $2 billion worth of Apple shares. Uh, And it goes on here. And this is, again, another uh, piece of the letter, which I thought was important. The average American teenager who uses a smartphone receives her first phone at age 10 and spends over 4.5 hours a day on it, excluding texting and talking. The investors wrote, adding that 78% of teens check their phones at least hourly, and 50% report feeling addicted to their phones. So they actually went so far as to use the word addicted. And then they they also based this on some research. I want to share from a January 8th article from NPR by Bill Chappelle, because NPR has a unique connection to some of the research that these two large investors were probably referencing. All right, this is Bill Chappelle on January 8th. Detailing some of the consequences of heavy smartphone use, the investors cited an inability to focus in class, along with a greater risk of depression and anxiety. Their letter to Apple also said researchers have found that U.S. teenagers who spend three hours a day or more on electronic devices are 35% more likely to have a risk factor for suicide than those who spend less than one hour. Uh, and and this factoid, I, I kind of mixed up the sentence here, but And those who spend five hours or more are 71% more likely to have that risk factor for suicide. So somebody has done the research here and they've, you know, collected the stats about time spent on devices and the relationship to something as, as serious as suicide. The letter cited work by Gene Twenge, and I'm just going to spell this professor's name, T. W-E-N-G-E, because I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Again, this is from NPR because they they actually um, did something with this professor. A psychology professor at San Diego State University who has written a book called iGen, and that's the small i from Apple, obviously, about what she has called troubling trends in teens feeling isolated, depressed, and helpless, as she told member station KPBS last year. The happiest teens have phones, but use them less than two hours a day. Twenge said in a tweet welcoming the Apple investor's letter. So obviously she responded right away this week and sent out a tweet. um, And then she added, more parents would buy phones if they were easier to set up safely for kids. Win-win, both ethically and financially. All right, so here's my reaction, the good and the bad. First, the good. I mean, this is socially responsible by some big money players who have already benefited from the success of Apple and the iPhone and would continue to benefit financially from growing iPhone sales. But the investors and their social intellectual circles see the downside for society as a whole. So this is a great example of change coming from culture, coming from within. And it's not just, uh, you know, I mean, it's not coming from a federal regulation. Let's put it that way. So that's kind of cool. And it's not motivated entirely by profit, I don't think. You know, I think that there's some people in the intellectual circles that uh, these investors are in where, you know, they're trying to have a moral conscience about what, you know, what they see going around them. 
going on around them. And and they took a chance. Um, I mean, I I might have predicted, oh, Apple shares could have plunged 10% on this move, uh, on this on this letter. And and they didn't, but that's a chance that they took as investors. All right, so uh, that was my reaction, my good reaction. Now, now, now my not so positive reaction to this letter. I think parental controls are good on the phones, but they don't really get to the heart of the problem. Kids will still want the drug, the phones, devices, whatever, and they'll find ways to get them if they don't have better ways to fulfill their interest, energy, and mental focus. So to me, that's the real question. And that's where I'm going. What is it about education that we fail so badly at preparing kids to actively engage their own learning and create study and careers that they might actually enjoy and be successful at? You know, uh, a, a pursuit that they're passionate about, whether it's in high school, college, and afterwards. And when I say education, I'm not just placing all the blame on schools. I'm talking about the home and family as one's first and forever school where the values and virtues of learning are taught or not, where curiosity about science, nature, history, math, language, and literature are either kindled or snuffed. And this was a problem before the smartphone, obviously. It's only worse now because kids aren't using their phones to look up science and history. They're using their phones to occupy their minds and emotions. And we're coming up to the big history I have with this problem. In December, I saw a YouTube interview with a former Facebook executive and co-owner of the Golden State Warriors, Chamath Palihaptia. I believe I'm pronouncing his, uh, his Indian name correctly, or I gave it a good shot anyway, didn't I? And this interview was actually a condensed 45-minute segment when he appeared on CNBC Squawk Box on December 12th with Andrew Ross Sorkin, Becky Quick, and Joe Kernan. Chamath said he intentionally opted out of social media because it was eroding the core foundations of how, how people behave. So, I mean, he's looking at social media as, you know, kind of killing <laughs> real social interaction. And, and after I saw that interview with Chamath, I kind of poked around and saw that, um, you know, he wasn't the first in, the, in that Facebook community, leaders of Facebook, so to speak, who, who created um, all that uh, wonderful technology in the past five years. And apparently Sean Parker, ex-Facebook president, has also been warning how the site was deliberately designed to exploit human vulnerability, meaning, you know, how our brains work, what we're, what we're attracted to, what we'll go for. And he has been quoted as saying, God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. And I've since learned that uh, Simon Sinek, a former ad agency exec and author of leadership books like Start With Why and Find Your Why, has also been a outspoken critic of social media and its effects on kids. But did you know that someone was warning us very explicitly about this over 30 years ago, a decade before the World Wide Web became our favorite destination? In 1989, in my junior year at the University of Illinois at Chicago, I took an English class where the professor handed us what he th must have thought was a pretty important book since it was only published a few years before. Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business was written by NYU educator Neil Postman and published in 1985. That book and its author, through his other books, are in my top five of most influential ideas, those that had the greatest impact on me. I was reading a lot of different things in the early 1990s, but Postman gave me a focus and a clarity that only a few others could, like Mortimer Adler of the Great Book Society or uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, the Harvard professor of biology and evolution. Postman opened Amusing Ourselves to Death with a short discussion of dystopias, those works of fiction that portend a darker future for mankind. George Orwell's 1984 would be the most famous example. But Postman suggested that the contemporary world was better reflected by Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, whose public was oppressed by their addiction to amusement, than by Orwell's vision, where they were oppressed by state control. All right, I'm going to take a quick break here, and I'll be back faster than you can spell dystopia. All right, we're back talking about this brave new world we're in. I hadn't read Aldous Huxley's Brave New World until 1989, 
And now that I think about it, I'm not sure if the professor had us read it first before amusing or the other way around. It would have been genius to do so because reading Brave New World, it would have planted this weird dystopia in our minds. And in case you haven't read it, but you should read Brave New World because it's it'll I mean, the book, I think, is was published in 1932 and it predicts so much. It was so prescient about where society was going with technology and how people could be controlled. So you can learn about things like SOMA. Um, there was also the complete separation of sex, love, and procreation. And then there were the feelies. And this is, uh, this is what going to the movies was about. You went to the movie theater and experienced the film with a suite of sensory add-ons to enhance its virtual reality. So this was virtual reality being predicted by Aldous Huxley, you know, 90 years ago. Just amazing. So whether the professor had us read Brave New World first or Postman's Amusing, in either case, I got the message. And Postman was merely passing on what he learned from Marshall McLuhan. The medium is the message, is a phrase coined by Marshall McLuhan, meaning that the form of a medium embeds itself in any message that it's transmitting or conveying. And this creates a symbiotic relationship by which the medium influences how the message is perceived. So that's kind of a wordy way of saying whatever the technology is, whether it's a phone you hold in your hand or the way you interact over the internet, the way you interact with appliances in your home, talking on the phone, whatever, it it sort of dictates the form of communication and it also influences the messages that go across it. Postman made this idea real and tangible with his research in the 70s and 80s. And it forced me to go back to an earlier, earlier book of his to see the formation of his ideas, especially as they related to children and education. In 1979, Postman published Teaching as a Conserving Activity. In the preface, he and his co-author referenced their radical 1960s book on education, Teaching as a Subversive Activity, where they were trying to disrupt formal education ideas, both at the university and high school levels. As a decade of reflection passed and new ideas hit them, they considered that every book should end with three words, or vice versa implying that, hey, we could be completely wrong. <laughs> and, and that's sort of what Postman meant teaching as a conserving activity to be, as the vice versa to teaching as a subversive activity. And where he's going with this is that things happened. So first of all, I should say subversive was, you know, it was about, it was the 1960s, right? He's, he's you know, every, every, every intellectual is a radical and proposing new ways of learning, um, in, in the midst of social change. What he noticed, though, in the 70s is that a couple of different things happened. One, maybe there was too much freedom, and so kids got away from actually reading books, and then also the rise of television as the primary educator. In fact, in teaching as a conserving activity, he stated that television was now the first curriculum, meaning because it was teaching kids at age three and four how to think and how to learn via things like Sesame Street. And so so school was becoming, you know, second best, the second curriculum. And so Postman's idea was that, you know, education should adjust. You know, whatever's happening in culture, it should adjust. And so what was happening in culture was that Kids were growing up watching Sesame Street as their primary mode uh, of learning, and that and and not to disparage Sesame Street because you know there's lots of great things about it, and I'm sure every family has a good story to tell about what they learned from, from Sesame Street. But it has a certain way of teaching, and and it and it could border on keeping kids entertained, engaged, amused. Again. Nothing terrible about that, because how can you learn if you're not engaged um, or interested? But um, but it's it could always push the the envelope, so to speak, in terms of how engaging, how entertaining, how amusing, um, 
And it, and even if Sesame Street, you know, set the bar high and did it right, what was the rest of television doing? Um, it was bordering on, it was definitely pushing the envelope of being amusing, entertaining, and captivating. And then that that curriculum teaches a way of learning. So, what Postman thought is that education should be the the uh, the thermostat to culture. That if uh, you know if culture is swinging one way, then education needs to kind of swing back the other way. So th- that was his some of his main ideas in uh, teaching as a conserving activity. And he also opened that book uh, with uh, talking about Socrates and Plato. How uh, you know Socrates. W- uh, bemoaned the death of the oral tradition, you know, and because Socrates was a big fan of the oral tradition for learning, right? Philosophical inquiry, the Socratic method, obviously named after him. And he was not looking forward to the age of writing, writing and books, which, you know, was a new form of technology. And Plato, so Plato had to deal with his mentor being sort of anti-technology and and what was to come, so that that's an interesting. If if you're interested in that at all, that's a great book to pick up too. So, if Postman was right or wrong about something like Sesame Street, I mean, I think he made the point that the medium does dictate how you know minds were learning. So, in his 1985 book, a few years later, amusing ourselves to death, he takes that to the next level about society as a whole, because he's not just talking about um, kids' education. He's talking about adults, you know, sitting in front of the TV, sitting down for a sitcom, right? A situation comedy and being entertained um, and and what that was doing to our public discourse, meaning people are reading, reading a lot less and watching a lot more TV. Now, coming back to kids, though, here's the thing that it got me thinking about that and I'm not sure. I, I think Postman talked about this later, and I'm going to get to his his 1992 book. But the thing that I started to notice was how hard television was working at being captivating. So I mean, I noticed throughout the 90s and the 2000s, um, you know, when you, if you just think of, if you just watch the evolution of a of a commercial or a television program, they were increasing the frames and sound changes exponentially, right? That's how television commercials and TV shows and films captivate your brain by changing the images very fast, the images and the sounds. And so your brain doesn't get bored and your brain stays focused and on this edge of anticipation about what's coming next. You know, what's the next tantalizing image or sound? So you can imagine what this does to children's brains. So this is something I was really concerned about in the 1990s because I was raising kids. And while I loved Disney films, I didn't like the stuff that was going on on TV because it was all based on, I mean, almost an art and a science, you know, from everywhere from Madison Avenue to Hollywood about how to make films, commercials, TV as tantalizing as possible. So it, it, in a sense, it, it was already training brains to become hypnotized. So this is before, you know, the internet got good at it and before smartphones, and for that matter, Facebook, turned it into a science of keeping brains captivated. You know, and what we really didn't understand in the 1990s was the brain, our own brain's drug, dopamine, and that that was what was being activated when we had images and sounds tantalizing us, captivating us. Uh, oh, what, the other thing I wanted to point out, and back to Postman, is that what he knew, though, is that that watching television was such a passive activity. Now, that might be fine for an adult who chooses mindless amusement and entertainment. I just want to sit on the couch and be mindless and be entertained. But um, that has very real consequences for children when they're not when their intellect isn't engaged um, and they're just passively absorbing the entertainment, you know, and it's, and, and the way the entertainment is crafted so that, you know, that's been having impacts for, 
for, you know, three decades. And so while, again, this letter to, uh, to Apple is important, it doesn't get to the fundamental debate about when we put kids in front of media and they're passively just absorbing entertainment and tantalizing images and sounds, what impact that has on their brains in terms of making them active learners. So, I mean, it, it, they're, they're, uh, you know, I can't prove this, but I'm sure there's some research out there that, that shows that if you grow up with too much television, the, the average person, I'm not saying this, you know, there are probably some geniuses out there who grew up watching hours and hours of television uh, and they're fine and they're geniuses. But um, the average kid, the average brain probably gets, it probably doesn't help their ability to learn lots of new stuff and be encouraged to pick up books and string together ideas. So I think you know where I'm going with that, you know, and, uh, and, and Postman in amusing ourselves to death, you know, he's, he's talking about our obsession with sitcoms as entertainment and amusement. And this is before reality TV. I don't even know what he had to say about reality TV. So let's talk about, you know, let's get down to, to the nitty gritty here. Why would companies spend so much time perfecting the art and science of capturing attention? Well, I mean, it's the grand game of Hollywood and Madison Avenue to sell us more things. And the only way they can sell us more things is if they capture control and captivate attention over and over and over again. So the bar has been continuously raised by advertising firms and film and TV producers to create more clever ways of captivating your attention. Or I could say that the bar has been lowered in terms of content, PG-13 appeal, and sensory tricks. And when I say PG-13 appeal, what I mean by that is pushing the boundaries of what you can put in a thus-rated film that also finds its way out of TV and cable. So, I mean, this is going on in the music videos, obviously, too. You know, they're masters at it. Uh, so it's all one big sensory tantalization. Now, Postman couldn't, of course, imagine that the smartphones that we have today. But he didn't need to in order to make the case against them. He saw where this was going. His 1992 book was called Technopoly, The Surrender of Culture to Technology. And the short and sweet description on Goodreads is so good, I'm going to read it to you. In this witty, often terrifying work of cultural criticism, the author of Amusing Ourselves to Death chronicles our transformation into a technopoly, a society that no longer merely uses technology as a support system, but instead is shaped by it with radical consequences for the meanings of politics, art, education, intelligence, and truth. Wow, that's a powerful summary of basically Neil Postman's life, life's work, you know, as in, the, in these books that I've talked about. This is from Wikipedia, another, another good description. Postman defines a technopoly as a society in which technology is deified, meaning the culture seeks its authorization in technology, finds its satisfactions in technology, and takes its orders from technology. And that's actually a direct quote from Postman. Technopoly is characterized by a surplus of information generated by technology. Which technological tools are in turn employed to cope with it in order to provide direction and purpose for society and individuals? So it's a, obviously it's a feedback loop, right? You know, the medium is the message becomes this feedback loop where we have technology and devices producing information and then you know, in turn, we have to have new tools to deal with that information, and we just go round and round. I'm sure everybody in a cubicle can relate to that. All right. Um, so, you know, I'm not, obviously, this, if you listen to any of my podcasts in the past year, <laughs> you know that I'm a fan of technology and that I gave up trying to resist technological change and, in fact, encourage you to embrace it. Uh, I mean, throughout 2017, I did several podcasts on the pace of technological change and how there was nothing we could do to stop it. I mean, it's just it's just unstoppable because it's what humans do. We invent, we create, we tinker, we innovate. So our job is always to co-create with the technology. So 
again, I think it's great that that it took two large investors to make this conversation about, you know, kids being addicted to devices a national conversation. And maybe it'll make some parents stop and think like, well, I'm not going to rely on the smartphone maker to, you know, give me the parental controls I want. Maybe I'm just going to hold off and not get my 10-year-old a phone, which I think is a brilliant idea. I mean, do they do they really, you know, it's like, yeah, you want your kid to have a phone so that they can call you whenever they need to when they're doing stuff after school or whatever, but do they need that device is the question. So it'll... It's it's a great national conversation to have. The podcast you want to listen to from uh, from last year, uh, "Don't Fight the Gravity of Exponential Change." Well, I did that on November twenty second as a as a good one to check out. Uh, the subtitle was "Technology is Reshaping Life and Business So Fast That Intelligent Adaptation Could Be the Number One Skill of the Twenty First Century." And um, I should bring up a book by Stephen Johnson. Stephen Johnson is a is an author who popularizes a lot of science stuff. And I remember reading his book, um, one of his books, where he you know, brought a lot of good neuroscience to the, to the surface and, and explained it in a good way. Um, but he also wrote a book after that, like in 2005, called Everything Bad is Good for You. And so this is the, the counter argument that, hey, um, and this is really before smartphones. I think you know, yeah, he wrote this. Book. So he's he's talking about you know, video games, movies, too much TV. You know, the the media we had even before smartphones. He's saying all that stuff is good for you. And his argument was because of the way it stimulates your brain, and that you're growing new neural connections makes you smarter. You know, you move through information faster on the internet, and that's all great. I I, I buy that argument. It's obviously worked for me, but there's. But you also have to be aware of a couple of things. One, does your device consume too much of your time? I've, no, I've noticed it before with me. Like I'm not on Facebook when I'm on my phone, when I'm on the train or something, but I'm all over Twitter and that's like my – Twitter's like my news feed. I'm constantly going through all the people I follow and getting new information, new stories, new articles – and some, sometimes I realize I overdo it. I've got a book that I want to be reading that's in my briefcase, and I'm not reading it because I just spent an hour on Twitter. So this is the, you know, the challenge that we all face is we want to soak up as much information as we can, but we got to make sure it's, it, it's quality stuff. And is it, is it the right stuff we need at the right time? Um, everybody makes fun of uh, Ty Lopez you know, the, the guy on the internet, and he's always uh, in his garage and showing off his Ferraris and stuff. And, uh, uh, but I got to hand it to him. He, you know, he's hammering home. Listen, if you ain't reading books, you know, you ain't going anywhere because, you know, maybe that's the thing you should be consuming more voraciously. Now, I don't know if he really reads a book a day, but I bet you, you know, now he's probably got the, the lifestyle where he can at his leisure, you know, pick up a book and he's got three hours to skim through it. Uh, but I think it's an excellent idea, and and to put down the smartphone, and to to pick up you know either, whether it's the latest business book, or um, something cool on science. Um, uh, I don't know if you know who Matt Ridley is. You should Google Matt Ridley. He is such a fantastic science writer. I mentioned one of my favorite science writers, uh, Stephen Jay Gould. Rest in peace. He was a professor at Harvard of of geology, biology. In the history of science. And he taught me so much about evolution on the planet here. I read 10 of his books, just, you know, a fantastic teacher um, where he could take, you know, deep science concepts and, and really break them down for people. So that's my argument. That's why I did this podcast because I thought, wow, it's, you know, it's so, it's so cool what's happening with Apple and what, I mean, at least we're on top of it. You know, things change so fast like we're having this conversation now. Are we even going to have smartphones five years from now? I mean, that's what I'm thinking about is, and you know, that's what Apple's thinking about is what is the next evolution in technology and devices, whether it's smart glasses um, or other kinds of uh, bio uh, semiconductors and, and, you know, how are we going to get our information and our communication so social media might be a problem now and smartphones for kids is a problem now, but it may get reinvented. And, and that's what I'm looking forward to is what is Apple going to do with augmented reality 
and some kind of smart glasses where you can uh, experience an enhanced form of communication and knowledge and learning with with the you know with the vast amount of information that's out there on the web, turn that into a tool that becomes an education powerhouse. And maybe the things, the the social things will become less interesting, you know, if we get kids more interested in learning about science and history and math. So uh, also in that podcast from November 22nd, Don't Fight the Gravity of Exponential Change, I talked about other Cassandras like the late, great Alvin Toffler and Google's Ray Kurzweil. So I'm making the, the strong argument to, to look at our behavior with our devices, especially if our kids are watching us, and, and, and make sure that they see us reading books just as often. Um, and I think this is especially important when our current model for the highest office in the land and the leader of our culture is someone who doesn't read books, um, you know, we need to set it the best example we can. Uh, and speaking of good books and great books to read, I mentioned Mortimer J. Adler as one of my top authors and influencers. Uh, now, if you don't know who Mortimer Adler was, you should Google him. And um, he is associated with the Great Book Society because he he helped um, just really launch the, the whole movement in the last century for people to know what the 100 greatest books are and to pick up a few of them. You know, going back to Plato and um, all the way up to Dickens and beyond. And Adler, you know, his philosophy was you you need to know history and read the great books, say even Darwin's original, to understand, you know, the evolution of society and culture. And I was so enamored with his approach to education that I actually wrote him a letter in um, – I think in the, around the year 2000, not exactly positive because Adler is now not with us any longer. And I think he lived into his mid nineties, but um, I wrote him a letter when he, I think he was about 90 to 92 and uh, just telling him how grateful I was for, for his life's work and, and how I wanted to do whatever I could to help with uh, keeping the great books alive. Uh, because it's such an important part of education and learning. You know, we can't, you you can't get it, you can't get everything from the internet, right? It's sometimes you just actually have to pick up a book and read what somebody wrote uh, 200 years ago or 2,000 years ago to understand where we are now. Thankfully, that letter got to Mr. Adler, and uh, I got a reply from uh, one of his assistants who said that uh, his heart was warmed by my letter. And that's when people still wrote letters. I may have sent that as an email, though. So that I don't know if that really counts. But <laughs> we're going to call it a letter. Okay? All right. Thanks for joining me on Mind Over Money. And we will talk to you soon.